So I'm going to talk to you about children's mental health today. It's also kind of a good way because basically I've spent my entire career at a university and started at the NHS last month. So I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing, what I want our team to do, how we build our team to look at some strategy unit. So I could use any advice anyone has about anything in terms of building out engineering, analytics, data science type team here. So I'm going to tell you about some work we did. So we are one of the five network data labs funded by the Health Foundation. We are the Scottish one way up here. There's another one in Leeds, Liverpool, Public Health Wales, and Northwest London. This is my take on what we're going to do. Work fast, link data, sort of like you saw before, large-scale data linkage within a health system. Make software, share everything software-wise. Improve its useful. So I think you work in the NHS, you're used to this sort of like paradigm, but like academics are not. We don't work fast. We often don't prove we're useful. So it was, we're halfway through our Health Foundation funding and we're in year four. And I loved, like, I, I just loved stop stressing about trying to write a nature paper and write a little software. That made me just radiantly happy. So that's why I switched my jobs. So far, so good. I really like it. So I'm going to tell you about what we did one year. The remit is that. All five sites work together with the Health Foundation to pick a topic and work on it for one year. And so that includes everything from permissions, data extracts, linkage, analysis, writing the report, doing the, the round tables, and then we'll see. It's still fast. Who's here from Health Foundation? It's still fast. But we're trying. So, what we did on our team was take all the children in North Scotland um, over a 10 year period. It winds up being about 100,000 kids per week. So that's um, under, I'm going to show you some data for under 25s. And we gathered up all their prescriptions that's publicly available in Scotland, all of their outpatient visits and their sociodemographics. Um, we did a whole lot more on urgent admissions and deaths that I won't chat about today. So it's sort of a classic, straightforward data linkage project. So we thought, so some of the results for the prescribing analysis, prescriptions double. I don't, I'm not finished. Right? So for me, I was just, just, so everything was just sort of, sort of mind boggling. No statistics, so just facts. So that if anything, the population has shrunk slightly. So if you normalize it to a per capita fifth number, it's a little bit. Small. And maybe just notice that it doesn't, it's not a, it's not a code that helps. This has been taking up like really, really smoothly for the past however many years. Oh, and then, look, I was going to ask you, how many kids between 18 and 24 do you think of a mental health prescription? All the past few years. 16%. One in six. That too, I was actually. Um, so I should say that we, we didn't define mental health prescriptions. We used to be in a, there's a class called mental health drugs. It includes melatonin, so it includes things for sleep disorders. So I think in some ways you could say that's an overcount. We did the paper with and without melatonin, so a research fellow is awesome, automated, generating the paper. Um, so that 16% does include some sleep stuff. It stays fairly flat for the under 18, and then as soon as you turn 18, prescribing really spikes. So what do they take? Um, I'm going to show you a couple of graphs that look like this, where there's just age groups down here. Under fives, older primary school kids, secondary school kids, and per prescriptions we have the kids who were just out of school and changed to 24. <clears throat> Let me just tell you in the BNF, anti anxiety and sleep are bungle. That's just how it is. It's all melatonin. Anti anxiety meds are not highly prescribed, um, like your young guns. So, you can see this sort of medium blue color is all the ADHD meds. First of all, that's what your primary schools are getting is ADHD meds. And that proportion of the prescription sort of wings as depression medication kicks in. Me too, basically, because I don't know anything about any. Three quarters of all prescriptions, or basically anyone under 15, are prescriptions to boys. So young boys are your medicated mental health population there. 
Um, and it's not until you get significantly older. I think this is over 15. Then you get a 50 50 ratio. And then once you get out of school, the girls come in with that depression medication. So, to sum up, in just the biggest possible, broadest possible terms, your young patient is your boy with ADHD. If you're a mental health care person, if you're thinking about buying mental health care, where it, it changes quite rapidly after puberty, and all of a sudden you have depressed girls. I should say we also did all the similar analysis with um, the Scottish index of multiple deprivation. So prescribing was double between the kids in the, the most deprived and the least deprived areas and at younger ages. So referrals to specialist mental health services, that's our CAM services. So here we looked at, there's just a wait list, it's very well monitored. Any kid who got a referral, whether accepted or not, this is just someone who the GP said, this kid needs a little more attention. We put them on the wait list for care. So we just looked at 10 years of who had been referred to CAMS. Graph as that you know, doubling of prescribing, basically. You're like, cancer referrals over time, just counted for me, please. It's very different, right? It's pretty flat, except in the summer, apparently nobody gets referred to CAMS. Every summer, all the kids get out of school and like, chill out. Um, or people are too busy, I guess, to go to the GP. So there's a super clear seasonal variation, but overall, my eyes means that right out. It halves during lockdown, and then it, it goes up by about 20%, but it's kind of annoying. So a very different look than that prescribing look. So what we did was take just this, these referral counts to say, who right, saves we did before. And here we have that same group of kids uh, we compress them because our candle is the under 18s. So again, we're just counting referrals for the different age groups. So not too many people under five getting referred to parents, but those have dropped off to almost not. Not treated, this is just referred. And it's not until you get to secondary school where that referrals to parents is really going up. I don't show it to you here, but basically, this is like the referrals to parents is all girls. The boys are just flat. This is also kind of heartbreaking. So this is the proportion of those referrals that are redirected. It's their preferred term. So they are not seen by the can specialist, they're seen by either the nurse, they're seen by someone at their school counselor, perhaps privately. So the rejection rate for referrals just to be eh, maybe 17 to 18%, and then that really spikes after the pandemic, it essentially almost doubles. So who's getting rejected? You direct. Now remember, there's not a lot of kids being referred. These are just proportions. Those who are being referred are not being accepted for treatment. And basically, has, hasn't increased seeing that older age group. So there has just been sort of a specialty shift And once you start rejecting, so your referrals to boys goes down, your rejection goes up. They tend to be younger. They tend to have ADHD. Cams used to see slightly less than half of their the people accepted for treatment for kids for girls. Now all of a sudden it's gone way up. So you can see the same sort of graph in age as well. So who is getting seen by these specials has really changed. Serious statistics. Just like optical statistics, you can see their population will definitely change. So, conclusions here, and then I'm going to sneak in some things that I basically just want to chat about. So, if you take my prescribing as a crop for mental health care, it's rising. I don't think it's super controversial. Um, and if you just count the number of referrals to CAMS that are accepted per quarter or something like that, it is dead flat. So the service has not expanded to meet what we think is probably a rising need in the community. Now, this could be because kids are mental health is suffering more. Perhaps there's a cultural norm has shifted where getting help has gone up. No idea. But it appears if you look at prescribing, need is rising. The service hasn't grown. 
that's that's a bottle. That's like a selection pressure on it, right? You have a you have an issue there. You have a conflict, <laughs> and basically, you have to make some choices. And right now, we can see older girls with depression are being accepted to camps. Younger boys, mostly with ADHD, are being redirected. I genuinely don't think, can't know, and don't think this is intentional. I don't think that CAMS is like, ha forget the bullets. I think it's that given pressure, there is a bottleneck. You specialize, whether you may even know it or not. So their average age of kid they treat has gone up by almost two years in the time of this study. So who they're seeing is very, very different. Took these results to CAMS. I should say, the study itself we designed with CAMS ahead of time before we got access to the data, all the data access in a secure setting, in a trusted research environment, anonymized data, aggregated by people who uh, weren't on our team. So we took these results out to CAMS. We're stressed by it a bit. We took it to the Getting It Right for Every Child committees that are on all the, the local councils. We took it to mental health support. And at one of the committees that I presented the results to the someone from Police Scotland in charge of suicide prevention was there. And yeah, it's not that boys don't have mental health issues, it's that they pop out in other ways, right? They they pop out needing help in a different way. And the CAMS people said they're good at treating internal officers, teenage girls, self-harm, depression, poor mental health manifesting in work. They're not good. They don't specialize in treating externalized or mental health. Acting out, being unable to sit still, perhaps crying. So the idea that we have to broaden our idea of what counts as mental health. But here's the tricky part. I can't see this. So we are blind to this data. It's not NHS data, doesn't have the right identifiers can't look at social work, can't look at crime statistics. So that's one of those things where you, you do all this, you go out, there's help, and then I'm just like, sorry, you know, we, we can't support that kind of stuff, which was a bit hard to come. So with my remaining few minutes, I wanted to chat about what can we do now? So we take these results all over, the people we thought might be interested in them, and say, what next, what next, what next? And some of it was sort of easy. Um, our one main collaborator within town said, okay, I have a, a two hiring lines that are opening. We're we seeing you to support this younger age bracket. We didn't realize there was this change over time. Great. What became really obvious to me is that this paradigm we have, Open Safely has it, our trusted research environment has it. So we go through this extraordinary permission process to get these data out of the NHS into a safe setting, anonymized. We can only ever legally publish it in aggregates. So I can't tell you about Jess Butler's mental health. I can't tell you these are the five kids who had 45 prescriptions, no referrals. I simply don't know. I can't tell, right? So we have this huge team. There's me. There's research fellows, public engagement specialists, tons of analysts, and we're doing all this work. We can't actually get it out of you. So, and God forbid if we had done really elaborate models as well. There's this allure of complicated ish. But the people at CAMS are just like, can you just tell me prescriptions that my patients have? Like, just that. And, and so, because we like to complicate things, these complicated problems are fun to solve. I think we sometimes miss the point that also, so it struck me on this project, which is children's mental health, we did a similar network data lab project for shielders, analysis of people shielding from COVID. Clinicians don't know who their patients, and that sounds idiotic, right? But they really don't. The entire electronic health record is set up for recording, for like sit reps, bed counts, things like that. But we were working with a rheumatologist, and she just wanted to know anyone who's been in the clinic the past six months, and within the past year, had a prescription from this long list of like steroids. She can't get that, right? And so that's the sort of thing that I think is trivial. If a little bit of sequel, it's no problem. 
that disconnect has sort of blown, sort of blown my mind. So what happens, and this is what happens at CAMS, they need to know their patients. They have an all singing, all dancing cell switch in addition to the electronic health records they need. So you, then the data provenance person in me starts to just <clears throat> panic. We actually spent a ton of time with them, showing them that those actually records plus or minus like a teeny tiny percentage, which I was like, who cares? And they were like, but that's four kids, you know? So just realizing there's this huge disconnect about what's easy, what's hard, what they actually need. And that hits the governance. We don't need to like solve governance today, but one thing I really don't understand is why a rheumatologist wants to know those patients. Maybe she wants to know like the patients that have really low index, high index of deprivation that might deserve a lot of extra care. Two joints plus less, right? And you make her a little each you know, website or whatever. I'm used to this, like if you start to do data links like that, that's research. And that gets shunted in the permissions pathway for that. And that's an 18 month timeline, and that's an organization. I genuinely don't understand what's public health, what's research, what requires like elaborate governance, and what's like two selects in a general, and you can tell rheumatologist who her patients are. I think part of it is that I want to publish that, but I want to show her who her patients are, and then you publish the tweet. And then they're like, oh, that's research, and you get permission. So navigating disclosure control, working transparently, linkage of protected characteristics in a way that's no way would I call that academic research, but I'm I'm up against it at the end of Also, we're a uh, NHS grant is in the Northeast of Scotland, it's like 500,000 people that we serve. We have like 45 data analysts in health intelligence. And from what I can tell, just just a month in, the vast majority of their working hours is spent doing what I would call reporting and type. Peter had a good three tasks specialty breakdown this morning that I didn't memorize. And I feel like right now we're trying to carve out that space for longer term. You know, is it strategy? I would think of it as data, data science, data analysis. It's the idea that some of some stuff takes the year. And sometimes you just need to protect some time from the firefighting that I watch really great people spend all of their time on. Because it's hard to say no to like stress out with intelligence. It's, really, it's not very interesting. You can't have any time. So how to manage that, I would love advice on. This one. No, which kids with poor mental health were on the child protection register? It's been three years. Mm -hmm. Social care has an identifier, not unique across the patients, and it's a hair follow And we can't get their NHS identifier map on without a ton of work by hand. So, this is the kind of thing there's nothing less glamorous than like advocating for a common ID. But it will make our life over the next like, 20 years so much easier if we just start to advocate for these really amazing things. And tell them, like tell them the horror stories, of what happens. The kids who can't identify between social care and the NHS are the most vulnerable. Kids. They're the ones who's most, the ones who need love. Like they're the ones we care most about, more blind. And I'm not sure how to talk about. It. I've been surprised how quickly some of the clinicians and like care providers are when we start to look at the data. And that's just me being naive. Foolish. I think they're used to, so not just in the NHS, but with the schools as well, they're used to seeing like okay. data analysis is people looking for problems and they're going to get in trouble. And I don't blame them for being like, shh, go away, you know? So just trying to figure out, I'm like, look, I need a tool. <laughs> and they're just like, no, children's health and mental health is fine. So figuring out how to build that safety culture, and it's not within the analysis team. It's out with the, the care providers. So that, think of it as NHS wants to be private and is a little bit critical. I don't have it to do that. Just move. Another thing I want to say, 
is like, I know all this stuff is really expensive. I know if you want to protect an analyst from the process of not ton of money. I know if you want to train people, if you want to hire people who are real data engineers at a cloud and whatnot. But I'm also thinking, like, I've been to a million HDR and play conferences, like multi million pound grants all the time. And let's exclude the grant. There's all the professor's time that are just looking for like interesting projects. Really not. It's like a lot of big words, great titles. It's not super rigorous and it's not super small. So how do we get NHS people into those conferences? I should also say academics are judged more and more these days on impact. And that means like, did anything do matter? And we can just be like, look, impact, guaranteed. So they'll actually get millions of pounds from the university to prove any of their research. So it makes for a very persuasive approach. Say, so give us your time and your brains and your team. We'll give you the ability to make something that we can guarantee you'll get promoted. And I think there is quite a bit of money around for this type of work. It's just a matter of academics often feel that NHS is very hard to break into. And the NHS maybe doesn't feel like academics know how to do anything practical. So figuring out how to move in that middle would be really neat. So if anyone wants to write grants, hit me up at dinner too. Um, I think this is my last slide. Well, almost my last slide. How do we think, like, if, if we study health inequalities all the time, like, we just have to advocate for cultural change. Like, I don't think it's actually about how much fruits and vegetables you eat. I think it's about, like, you know, your mom has to work six jobs. And there's no time to go shopping. So I think part of us has to just admit this is a politics problem. I won't bang on this. So these are the final ones. So if you want, so I should say, these are the people who actually did the work with me. Will Ball is the research fellow who did all of the, the prescribing analysis. Sharon is here today. She ran the PPIU work. Um, we had collaborators from Health Intelligence here. We had collaborators from within the clinical team at the university and in our TRE. So I was really proud of the team we built for this. Just want to like tire them all at the end of the chance. Liz, if you want to read more about how the five sites combine this analysis, this document has more policy recommendations from, from within the, than across the entire UK. And I see my team. Right. <laughs> 95% remote, right? I know everything is really horrible. So we have two big grants. We have the Network Data Lab, which is just under a million pounds over six years. We help determine its research collaborators and AHR funding, five million pounds for five years. Um, senior analyst data science works so hard for this to be advanced that it closes on Friday. Um, the engineering world just closed, but I think there will be another one opening up. Research fellow post is at the uni that'll be hopefully staffed by September. That will probably be a bit more in person. If you have any like professors in your pockets, we need one as well, helping us run our TR. So thanks so much. Happy to answer any questions.